be exalted. I will call upon the Lord, who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. The Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. The Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. I will call upon the Lord. Next, we'll sing hymn number 67. Hymn 6 7. We'll sing the first and the third stanza. <clears throat> for the beauty of the earth, for the beauty of the skies, for the love which from our birth over and around the slice. Lord of all, to Thee we raise this our sacrifice of praise for Thy church that evermore lifted holy hands above. Offering upon every shore her pure sacrifice of love. Lord of all, to thee we raise this our sacrifice of praise. We'll sing one more hymn, hymn number 66, and after this we'll have the opening prayer. Hymn number 66. <clears throat> Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly Son and Holy Ghost. Let us go to our Lord in prayer. Let us pray. <clears throat> Almighty Father in heaven, we thank you, dear Father, for this wonderful day that you've given us. We thank you, dear Father, for this time that we can gather here together physically to be able to uh, sing praises unto thee to learn a portion from thy word and uh, to be able to worship you later uh, freely in this place. We thank you, dear Father, for your love and your care uh, so richly and so deeply that you gave your only begotten Son to uh, die on that cross so that we can have the hope of salvation, that, so that we can have the uh, reconciliation back to you if we were to believe in the gospel message of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. We pray then, Father, uh, for the uh, things that we're about to listen, the uh, lessons that we're about to um, learn. Pray then, Father, that we'll be able to take it to heart, to be able to encourage each and every one of us uh, together, to be able to keep on keeping on, to be able to uh, stay faithful to you, to live a life that's righteous in your sight. We pray then, Father, for courage and wisdom and understanding for the various teachers that is uh, teaching today. Pray that um, you will be able to grant them that, to be able to expound from your word in spirit and in truth. We thank you, dear Father, once again for everything. All this pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Very, very good morning to all. Uh, today we won't be looking at Hosea, so we finished that last week. So today we'll uh, start on a new series on the study of hymns. Um, and the hymn that I chose to look at this morning is Hymn 490, It Is Well With My Soul. So if you have a hymn book, um, you can turn to it. Uh, if not, you will be on the screen anyways. Um, so it is a well-known hymn and we have sung it many, many times. And nonetheless, have we actually pondered over uh, the lyrics in this hymn or the circumstances 
and personal story that compelled the author, Horatio Spafford, to pen down these words, It is well with my soul. So the original manuscript has four verses. Uh, the daughter of Horatio said a verse was later added, and the last line of the original song was modified. And, uh, and in our hymn books, uh, we only have three verses. So we will begin by looking at the modified five verses, and then we'll go through the personal story and the author, uh, that the author Horatio Spafford had gone through, and what we can learn from his story. And lastly, we will go through all three stanzas that we have in our hymn book today, hopefully with a better understanding of the background story, the faith and the meaning behind It Is Well With My Soul. All right, so let's begin. So as you can see on the screen, uh, that is the original manuscript that uh, Horatio penned down. And later on, it was put together with the tune written by this guy, Philip Bliss. And um, the verses are there, but I don't think you can see it clearly. But either way, I have typed it out for you guys. So let's go through the hymn together. Um, so the, f the first one is, When peace like a river attended my way, When sorrows like sea billows roll, Whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, It is well, it is well with my soul. Though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ hath regarded my helpless estate and hath shed his own blood for my soul. So that's a one that is different from our hymn book, or oh, that's not in the hymn book. My sin, O oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole. It's nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O oh, my soul. For me, be it Christ, be it Christ, hence to live. If Jordan above me shall roll, no pain shall be mine, for in death as in life, thou wilt, wilt whisper thy peace to my soul. And Lord, haste the day when the faith shall be sight, the clouds be rolled back as a scroll, the trump shall resound, and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. So it seems pretty peaceful. Like, no matter what, all is well, doesn't it? But let's look at under what circumstances and story that these words were penned down. Um, but first of all, who is the author? His name is Horatio Gates Spafford. You can find his name on the bottom left of the hymn book if you have one uh, right there with you. Um, and who is he? He was born in, on the 20th of October, 1828, in New York. He was a prominent American lawyer, and he was also very active at his own congregation. He married Anna Larson of Stavanger, uh, Norway, and they both live in Chicago. He was rich and successful. He was a senior partner in a large law firm. He has lots of investment properties and real estate in the north of uh, Chicago. And he was blessed with five kids at that time. They were a well-known family, and they were also active uh, in their church always opening their homes to visitors and uh, evangelists, etc. So you might think, of course it is well in my soul. I'm, my life is good. I'm rich, I'm successful, I'm a highly influential member of society and the community that I live in. But no, this wasn't the time where he wrote uh, the lyrics of this hymn. And on the contrary, it was written at a time when he had suffered unspeakable tragedy and the story unfolded like this. 1870, their only son, Horatio Jr., unfortunately died of scarlet fever. He was only four years old. And then a year later, in October 1871, um, so nearing his 44th birthday, the Great Fire of Chicago swept through downtown Chicago, reducing the city to ashes. The fire burned for three days, killed approximately 300 people, destroyed an area of nine kilometers square. It was one of the largest U.S. disasters of the century destroying over 17,000 structures around the city and left more than 100,000 residents homeless. And remember his real estate uh, investment properties in Chicago? The fire destroyed most of his investment, plunging him into a great financial loss. So not only him, but also his family were affected by the misfortunes that they have encountered. And despite that, the Spafford sought to demonstrate Christ's love by helping those who are in need and those who, are, who, are, who were grief-stricken. But to get away from all the disaster they had gone through within a short period of time, two years later, in 1873, 
he decided to take his wife and uh, the remaining four daughters on a holiday to England. So in late 1873, the Spaffords were to catch the French ship Ville du Havre, if I pronounce that correctly, across the Atlantic. That little ship there, I mean, it's bigger in real life. Um, yet just before they sailed, Horatio had a last minute business issue to handle. So, but he didn't want to ruin the family holiday, so he persuaded his family to go ahead uh, as planned and he would follow on later. So his wife and, four, uh, and their four remaining children sailed to Europe. However, just nine days later, he received a telegram from his wife in Wales. It read, saved alone. So what happened? On 22nd of November, 1873, while crossing the Atlantic on the steamship Vele du Havre, the vessel was struck by uh, another ship, an iron sailing ship. 226 people lost their lives um, as the ship sank within only 12 minutes. When the ship was sinking, Anna stood bravely on the deck with her daughters, Annie, Maggie, Bessie and uh, Tanetta, clinging desperately to her, uh, holding as tight as they could. Anna's last memory um, had been of her baby being torn violently from her arms by the force of the cold, violent and unmerciful waves. So all four of their children died that day. Anna was saved by a plank which floated beneath her, her unconscious body that propped her up. When she was rescued, she immediately recalled the words of her friend, which is, it's easy to be grateful and good when you have so much, but take care that you are not a fair-weathered friend to God. So which means beware not only to be grateful and good when things are going well, but also when things seem to go against you. So upon hearing the terrible news, Horatio Spafford, uh, Spafford boarded the next ship to join his wife, and one particular day uh, during the voyage, the captain summoned him to the bridge of the vessel. Pointing to his charts, he explained that they were then passing over the very spot where the Valley du Havre had sank, or sunk, and that's also the place where his daughters had died. The captain told him, I believe we are now passing the place where the ship sank. The water is three miles deep. And after hearing this, Horatio returned to his cabin and penned the lyrics of this great hymn, It is well with my soul. Then, then the first line of which, when peace like a river attended my way. So following the sinking of uh, the ship, Vela du Havre, Anna gave birth to three children, Horatio Gautner, uh, named after uh, the brother who died and also after their father, Bertha Hedges and Grace. But unfortunately, they were not spared from one more sadness. On the 11th of February, 1880, their only other son, uh, Horatio, also died at a young age of three years old. So this final tragedy, after a decade of financial loss and personal grief, the Spaffords left America in August, 1881. With a number of like-minded Christians and settled in Jerusalem, they served the needy, helped the poor, and cared for the sick and took in homeless children. Um, the music, which was written by Philip Bliss, was named after the ship, uh, which Horatio, uh, Horatio and Anna's daughter, um, well, which Anna's daughter had died, Ville du Havre, which you can see at the bottom right of the hymn book. Horatio Spafford died of malaria on the 16th of October, 1888, just four days before his 60th birthday. So this is all very heavy stuff. Uh, even when I'm like writing this. So this is a guy who had, every, who had once lost everything, his sons, his entire life savings, and his girls. Imagine how much pain he had to go through when all of this started happening one by one. And despite losing everything that he had, he still said, it is well with my soul. And let's take a step back and put ourselves in his shoes. Imagine everything that you cherish the most just disappear. The people that you love, the money and material things that you work so hard for, your precious children just vanish, just like that, one by one. If it were you, would you what would your reaction be? Would you still say, it is well with my soul? And hold that thought as we look into this hymn. The first stanza, it reads, when peace like a river attended my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, Whatever my lot, 
Thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. So we can see here, when things are peaceful and smooth, he is contented. And when things went haywire, he's telling us that it is well with his soul. It doesn't mean he's not sad. It doesn't mean he's not devastated. But it shows that he has something or someone uh, to rely on. And you read deeper into these words, when sorrows like sea billows roll. I always take this sentence for granted. But look carefully, billows means a large amount of something. His sorrows is so overwhelming that it is compared to the sea, the violent waves that consume um, her, his daughters, the waves that never stop consuming you, making you breathless, and eventually drown you down to death. And yet, it is well with his soul. And why? Because the Lord has taught him this, which links to the second stanza. My sin, oh the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O oh my soul. So talking about his sins or our sins, how blissful it is, because not part of it, not a little bit, not a quarter, but the whole lot, all of it, are washed away and nailed down to the cross when Jesus sacrificed his life for us, and we bear it no more. We are saved by Jesus' blood. And for this, he praised the Lord. And that stanza, And Lord, haste the day when the faith shall be sight. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. So this stanza shows that he's eager for the Lord's return. He's prepared and ready. And the question is, are we? What we can take away from his life story is that no matter what situation you are in, you can have peace if your heart is set right with God. You have to safeguard your soul, not only when you are high above, but also when you hit rock bottom. There are bound to be ups and downs in everybody's lives. We all face problems and obstacles of our own. Who doesn't? If the Christian life or life in general is easy and moves like a straight line um, with no ups and downs, you might be dead. Because even your ECG or your electrocardiogram has ups and downs to prove that you're alive. But one thing we need to really understand is this. We are not judged by what happened to us, but we will be judged by what our responses are. I'll repeat that. We are not judged by what happened to us, but we will be judged by what our responses are. When we are rich and successful, do we remember those who are in need? Are we humble or are we like, the, like Israel in, Hose, in the book of Hosea? We pride ourselves uh, in our wealth and we forget that it is actually blessed by God and given by God. When we hit rock bottom, do we blame or curse God or get angry at Him and drift away? Are we a fair-weathered uh, Christian? We can't control what happened to us, but we definitely can control what happened next, which is our actions and our response. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we need to know that God loves those who are his children, and he works all things together for good for us. Let's read Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. He has a plan for us, and if we continue to set our hearts right and do his will, we can rest assured that our soul will be safe. And who knows, maybe life on this earth uh, will turn out be better as well. Um, let's read 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6 to verse, to verse 7. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honour at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So it is a test of our faith. And we know that if we succeed, it shapes our character because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, uh, character, and character, hope. And hope does not disappoint us. As, as is written in Romans chapter 5, verse 3 to verse 5. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance, character, and character, hope. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. We also know that we can achieve and face anything through Christ who gives us strength. Philippians chapter 4 verse 13. And that is why 
he said, it is well with my soul because he has this hope of salvation and he knows God is with him at all times, good or bad. And Horatius Spafford's tragic story reminds me of Job's account as well. Job was wealthy. He was considered as uh, the greatest of all the people of the East in Job chapter 1, verse 3. He had seven sons and three daughters. But then Job lost just about everything, his sheep, oxen, camels, servants, uh, and his sons and daughters as well. He himself was sick. But yet in the midst of the trying and difficult time, Job remained faithful to God. Job was patient. He endured tremendous amount of suffering, but yet he did not lose faith. Even when his friends who went to comfort him falsely accused him of wrongdoing, even then he remained blameless and faithful to God. Let's look at a summary of Job's counseling session. I did not come up with that. I used a study Bible. So Job's wife, he, her advice to Job is, curse God and die. And then Job's reply is, shall we indeed accept good from God and shall we not accept adversity? So Job recognizes that it is God that gives him all the good things in life. And if God wants to take it back, he can. And we shouldn't serve God for the purpose of having good things in life. If we receive any blessing, it is a bonus, not a right. And then we can see, follow down, uh, Eliphaz, Bildad, Zophar. They said, um, let's look at Bildad's. Does God subvert judgment or does the Almighty pervert justice? And then Zophar said, um, as, trying to explain his suffering, for he knows deceitful men, he sees wickedness also. Will he, then, uh, will he not then consider it? And then their advice to Job is, seek God, make your supplication, be pure and upright. And then um, prepare your heart, stretch out your hand toward him, put iniquity far away. But Job's reply is, I am blameless. Show me why you contend with me. And uh, towards his friends who went to comfort him, Job says, you are all worthless physicians. And then um, in chapter 13, verse 3, I desire to reason with God. And then you can see they all went on and went on saying that it is because of his sin, that's why he's suffering. And then uh, what I want to divert your attention to is the build that one. So Job's reply, you have wronged me, have pity on me. So he knows that he did, he, he did not do anything wrong. It's not because of sin that was suffering. But then his friends uh, were determined that it was because of that. And then they went on and also uh, I would like to turn your attention to Job's reply to build that. That one. Far be it from me that I should say you are right. Till I die, I will not put away my integrity from me. So you can see the thought process of Job's friend's logic. Um, so it's like you have done wrong, you are sinned against God and that's why you are suffering. You need to obey God, um, things like that. Sometimes we think suffering is because of punishment, and yes, it could be. It could also be a consequence of what you have done wrong. But not all suffering are because of punishment, and we may never know why bad things happen to good men. Job's friends, Bildad, uh, Eliphaz, and Zophar had concluded that Job's suffering was certainly evidence of sin in his life. They were not reciting falsehood, though, because much of what they said was theologically sound, at least in the abstract. The scriptures, especially in Deuteronomy uh, 27 and 28, indicate that the righteous can expect God's blessing and the wicked can expect God's curse. Both Eliphaz and Zophar considered that sometimes the wicked enjoyed temporary prosperity as Job had. However, they asserted, as the book of Proverbs does, um, that eventually the wicked would be punished. Conversely, Elihu declared that God would reward the righteous with prosperity and security. The book of Psalms teaches the same doctrine, that whatever the righteous person does shall prosper, in Psalms chapter 1 verse 3. With this type of reasoning, all of Job's friends came to the same conclusion. Job's suffering was a sign of sin in his life. So where did they go wrong? Where did Job's counselors or friends go wrong? Their mistake was that they misapplied, the and, they misapplied and abstract truth. Yes, in the end, God rewards the righteous and punishes the wicked, Moreover, God himself had declared to Moses that he would not leave, leave the guilty unpunished in Exodus 34 verse 7. But Job's friends 
did not have God's perspective on Job's situation. Like Jesus' disciples, they automatically assumed that when catastrophe struck, it was God's punishment on that person. If you would turn your Bible to John chapter 9, verse 1 to verse 3. I do not have that on the screen. So John chapter 9, verse 1 to verse 3. I'll read to you. Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And in verse 3, Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. But Job's story and Jesus' response to his disciples indicate that human suffering is not always the sign of God's judgment. In this fallen world, sometimes the innocent suffer, but even through their suffering, God accomplishes his goodwill. In Job's case, Satan's false accusa accusation was refuted and God's sovereignty was proven. The suffering of the blind man made it possible for Jesus to demonstrate his healing power and to transform the man into a witness to Jesus, uh, deity. Often our suffering or the suffering of others blinds us uh, to the reality that God is working his own good purpose uh, through a fallen world. And sometimes the rain just falls on both the good and the bad. And sometimes hailstorm struck on my car in 2010 and the BMW that parked next to me. So it happens. Either way, we know Job was later on restored and gained more than what he lost. And most importantly, we know that Job hang on to the faith, no matter at peace or at sorrow. He kept his faith. And we ought to do likewise, like Job, like Horatio. So in conclusion, I know it's a, uh, a short lesson. I hope we now understand the hymn, It Is Well With My Soul, better. The tragic story behind the words penned down in the hymn. And continue to believe, continue to be steadfast in faith, knowing that when all of these are over, we'll be in heaven with one another again. So no matter what life throws at us, even death itself has no power over us or against us. We are already victorious as long as we keep the faith and obey God. And hopefully when we hit rock bottom or even when we are high up, we still can say, it is well with my soul. Before we close, are there any comments? If not, let's close in a word of prayer. Let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for this beautiful morning that we can gather here to sing praises to you and to uh, learn another portion of your word, Lord. Father, we thank you Lord, for the many blessings that you have showered upon us. We know that it's more than what we need. And Father, we would like to pray for your guidance in our lives through both ups and downs. We pray that you would be with us, mold us, shape us, and help us to become better Christians each day to present ourselves blameless in your sight. And we thank you, Lord, for Jesus, who has sacrificed his life and shed his blood for the remission of our sins. And through his blood and through his death, we are victorious. Lastly, we pray for forgiveness, for we know that we have fallen short of your glory, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.
If we can, can we uh, get set down? Let us all get set down as we will sing a couple of choruses. A very good morning to one and all. There's no more YMCA this morning. <laughs> we'll sing a, a couple of crosses before we uh, have the worship service. And we hand the uh, song leading to uh, Brother Haushen. Wonderful, wonderful Jesus is to me. Counselor, mighty God, Prince of Peace is He, saving me, keeping me from all sin and shame. Wonderful is my Redeemer, praise His name. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Rejoice, rejoice, and again I say rejoice. Rejoice, rejoice, and again I say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Okay, one more chorus and uh, we'll hand it to uh, song leading to Brother Haushin. In moments like this, I sing out a song. I sing out a love song to Jesus. In moments like this, I lift up my voice. I lift up my voice to the Lord. Singing, I love you, Lord. Singing, I love you, Lord. Singing, I love you, Lord. I love you. Very good morning to everyone present. Let us uh, begin our worship hour by singing a couple of hymns. We'll begin by singing hymn number 528. Hymn 528. We'll sing the first, second, and fourth stanza. <clears throat> Ready? I know that my Redeemer lives and never prays for me. I know eternal life he gives from sin and sorrow free i know i know that my redeemer lives i know i know eternal life he gives i know i know that my redeemer lives he that I should wholly be in word in thought, in deed, that 
and I, His only face may see, when from this earth life free. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives, I know, I know eternal life He gives, I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know that over yonder stands a place prepared for me, a home, a house not made with hands, most wonderful to see. I know I Redeemer lives, I know, I know eternal life He gives, I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. <clears throat> Next we'll sing hymn number 211, 212 and 213. We'll sing hymn 211, 212 and 213, one after the other. And after singing of the uh, medley of hymns, we'll look upon to Brother Greg to lead us in the opening prayer. Hymn 211, 212, and 213. <clears throat> there is a Saviour, what joys express. His eyes are mercy, His word is rest. For each tomorrow, for yesterday, there is a Saviour. into your love leanness when all things that surround become shadows in the light of you when I found the joy of reaching your heart when my will become central in your love when all things that surround become shadows in the light of you i worship you i worship you to worship you. I worship you. I worship you. The reason I live is to worship you. To accomplish what concerns me today He is able, more than able To handle anything that comes my way He is able, more than able to do much more than I could ever dream. He is able, more than able, 
to make me what he wants me to be. Bergring. Good morning, church, and welcome to our visitors this morning. Appreciate you coming along and being with us this morning. And a special congratulations to Eustasia and uh, Gerald. Mr. and Mrs. Yeo, lovely to have you here this morning. It's great. So let's, before we go into worship this morning, let's uh, have a word of prayer. Let's pray. <clears throat> our Lord and our God, we come before thee thanking you for this morning, for the opportunity to worship you, to meet around your word, to re meet around the table that uh, was instituted by Jesus so long ago. We thank you for the freedom we have to worship you, and we do ask that this may continue because this often we probably take for granted. We live in a world where there are pockets of um, unrest and unsettling, threats of wars and issues and, and things that happen that uh, make us wonder about what's happening in the world. We maybe worry, panic, fear. We pray for those countries and the leaders that um, have uh, negative inklings that you may somehow work in their lives and their hearts, that they may consider seriously what they're doing and the reasons by which they're doing these things. We pray for our own leaders here in Australia, whatever political persuasion, that peace and stability may um, be restored in the pockets to the, of uh, areas where it is not. We thank you for the freedom we have to worship you and we thank you that we can meet together such as this. Not everyone around this globe has that opportunity and has the freedom to do so and we take this for granted. We thank you for Jesus, your son and our saviour for the hope that we have in him. We thank you that he died on the cross but more importantly that he rose again and it's your right hand. We thank you that we can meet together such as this and partake of the emblems that represent his body and his blood. And Father, we know that we are not perfect by any stretch, but only by the blood of Christ do we have hope and that you see us as perfect. We know that we fall short and we pray that we may work hard to um, be examples to others around us, to uh, encourage them to come to know you and obey you. We thank you for those in past days or years that have uh, played a part in our lives to bring us to where we are. Many would have passed on, but Father, the memory and the influence they've had has been a blessing to us, and we thank you for this. We thank you for Jesus, your Son and our Saviour, who is perfect without sin, and we thank you that we can worship him. We thank you that we worship a living Saviour. And Father, as we go into this worship service now, as we ask for forgiveness where we failed you and let you down, Maybe we've done something even unaware that has uh, brought scorn to your name. We apologise. Father, we pray for the congregation here, for those who are older that maybe suffer health problems, for those of us who maybe struggle with spiritual problems, that we can turn to you and lean on you and trust in you in all things. Father, we thank you for the freedom we have of prayer and the privilege of prayer that we can communicate with the almighty God of heaven and earth. And Lord, as we go into this worship service now, we pray that all that we may do may be pleasing to you, to glorify and honour you, and that we may humble ourselves before you to your glory. We offer this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Next, we shall sing hymn number 626, hymn 626. <clears throat> Ready? Christ for the world we sing, the world to Christ we bring, when loving zeal the poor and dead that born the faint and overborn sin sick and sorrow one whom Christ 
Christ appeal. Christ for the world we sing. The world to Christ we bring. With one accord, with us the world to share with us reproach to death with us the cross to bear for Christ our Lord. <clears throat> Next we shall sing hymn number 898. Hymn 898. <clears throat> As I travel through life with its trouble and strife, I have a glorious hope to give cheer on the way. Soon my toil will be your, and I rest on that shore where the night has been turned into day. Up in paradise valley, by the side of the river of life, up in paradise valley, we'll be free from all pain and all strife. That will live in the garden, in the shade of the evergreen tree. How I long for the paradise valley, where the beauty of heaven I'll see. Though your garden is rare, it is not to compare with the flowers that bloom in the garden above. In the midst of its groves, share its perfect sweet rose. Tis a wonderful flower we love. Up in Paradise Valley, by the side of the river of life, up in Paradise Valley, we'll be free from all pain and all strife. That will live in the garden, near the shade of the evergreen tree. How I long for the paradise valley Where the beauty of heaven I see Next we'll sing hymn number 329 <clears throat> Hymn 329 As we uh, prepare our hearts and minds to partake of the Lord's Supper soon And after singing this hymn We look upon to uh, Brother Kongjo To deliver his Lord's Supper talk for this morning Assisted by Brother Booning and by Brother Rob him 328. <clears throat> Once I was strained in sin's dark valley, no hope within could I see. They searched through heaven and found a Savior to save a poor lost soul like me. Oh, what a Savior! Oh, hallelujah! His heart was broken on Calvary. His hands were nailed, scarred, his side was riven. He gave his life blood for even me. There's chilly waters, I'll soon be crossing. His hand will lead me safe all. I'll join the chorus in that great sea. 
city and sing up there forevermore. Oh, what a Savior! Oh, hallelujah! His heart was broken on Calvary. His hands were nail-scarred, His side was riven, He gave His life blood for even me. Last week and a couple of months ago, I was preparing lessons on the book of Hosea. And I have to say, I really enjoyed uh, preparing the lessons for those studies. Not only it appealed to the emotional side of um, uh, us, but it also helped us to have a glimpse of what uh, God had felt when Israel sinned, or when we sinned. God provided everything for us, the food that we have, the friendships that we have, the roof over our heads, and most importantly, Jesus, his only son, he humbled himself and became man to be tempted, to be tortured, accused, and also to suffer and die on the cross for us. He shed his blood so that our sins can be washed away. All of this while we are still sinners. And we were the unfaithful wife, and God has always been faithful to us, imploring us to come back to him even after we fail and fail and fail again. But if we think about it, what bargaining chip do we have um, that do we have to this relationship? We have nothing, nothing at all, nothing on us, nothing that can build with our hands um, that God needs, nothing that an unfaithful spouse can bring to the table. Mercy and grace is the only hope that we have. And God yet again provided us the hope of eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Through His blood, our sins are washed away, and through His blood, we have the new covenant, and through his blood, we are victorious over death. Now, before we partake the Lord's Supper, I just want to read a few verses. If you would, please turn your Bible with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 50 to verse 58. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 50 to verse 58. Verse 50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Verse 55, O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not vain in the Lord. Let us now pray. The Almighty Father in heaven, we thank Lord for Jesus, Lord, for He has um, sacrificed His life um, to endure uh, pain and suffering in this world, uh, to humble Himself uh, into man, uh, to be separate with, um, with you, Lord, and to um, go through all the pain and sufferings, Lord, and eventually die on the cross for the remission of our sins. Father, as we partake, um, the bread we symbolize the body of Jesus Christ. We pray that you help us remember all the things that Jesus has gone through to make this possible. Just let me pray. Amen.
Let us partake together. Let us pray again. Dear Father in heaven, in like manner, um, we thank you, Lord, for Jesus who has shed his blood on the cross for the remission of our sins, Lord. And Father, as we partake uh, the fruit of the vine, uh, we pray that you help us to partake in a manner that is pleasing unto your side, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us partake together. The Lord's Supper is now concluded. Uh, before we pass along the collection back, let us go to our Father in prayer. The Almighty Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for the many blessings that you have shown us, Lord. Father, we know that you've given us more than what we need, Lord, Father. Uh, we are truly grateful. And Father, we pray that as we give a portion back uh, to you, Lord, we pray that the funds collected today will be put into good use for the furtherance of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
if you have your hymn books with you, please mark hymn number 948. Please mark hymn 948 as the hymn of invitation and encouragement for this morning. And before, we have the scripture reading by Brother Walter, followed by the lesson by Brother Quinton. We shall sing hymn number 943. Hymn 943. <clears throat> Heavy were heart that's weary, tending a load of care. Are you a soul that's seeking rest from the burden you bear? Do you know, my Jesus? Do you know, my friend? Have you heard? He loves you, and that He will abide till the end who knows your disappointments who hear each time you cry who <coughs> understands your heart aches, who dries the tears from your eyes. Do you know, my Jesus, do you know, my friend? Have you heard? He loves you and that he will abide till the end. Bro Walter. scripture reading this morning is from Job chapter 40 from verse 6 to verse 12 from the New American Standard. Then the Lord answered Job out of the storm and said, Now gird up your loins like a man. I will ask you and you instruct, you instruct me. Will you really annul my judgment? Will you condemn me that you may be justified? Or do you have an arm like God? And can you thunder with a voice like his? Adorn yourselves with eminence and dignity and clothe yourselves with honour and majesty. Pour out the overflowings of your anger and look on everyone who is proud and make him low. Look on everyone who is proud and humble him and thread down the wicked where they, st tread down the wicked where they stand. Hide them in the dust together, bind them in the hidden place. Then I will confess to you that your own right hand can save you. Good morning, church. A warm welcome to everyone this morning. Heaven, what a wonderful place that will be. Mansions, there will be roads of gold, there will be no tears, no sadness, no death, no dying eternal life in the presence of our Creator and no masks. <laughs> oh, everyone was telling me to take my mask off. I'm getting the hell away. I'm savoring this moment. 
Whoa. All right, jokes aside, do you know where you're going? It was interesting. Before I get to what's interesting, um, I thought I'd ask you, what is the greatest marriage-saving invention of the modern era? The GPS. <laughs> And it was so funny, actually, when I, um, maybe, I don't know, half, when, when maybe this would be lost, depending on how long COVID goes, maybe it'll never be lost. But um, it was funny when I emailed, or it was interesting, that was what I was going to say, but I didn't want to take away from that reveal. Uh, when I e uh, messaged uh, to Elena the title of this morning's lesson, uh, she replied back immediately, I'm going home. And I thought, oh, that was really funny because when I was on my way home, I'd been trying to work out what can I title this morning's lesson for quite a while. And um, when I was on my way home yesterday, uh, my youngest really is a bit of a warrior. He likes to worry about anything and everything. In fact, none of us have to worry because we'll just let um, Tide do all the worrying. <laughs> Um, he worries about whether or not the doors are locked. He worries about whether or not the windows are open. He worries about how hard the fan is going at night. He really just enjoys worrying about things. So we as a family tend not to because we know Tide will have it covered. <laughs> and so on our way home yesterday, uh, I'm not so good in the Swan Valley with all the little roads and intertwines. And so as we were leaving Gerald's place, I put on our navigation and I said you know what take me home and very friendly she responded and said oh it'll be nice to be home and I thought oh, this is a lovely thing to say to me but yes take me home and we were going out and eventually I got to a road where I was like oh, I recognize what this is so okay you know cancel navigation and Tide immediately said do you know where you're going <laughs> I said yes Tide I know where I'm going and then of course that got me thinking do we know where we're going? And I thought some of the inventions and some of the gadgets that, you know, today's generation probably won't recognize. Uh, in thinking about the GPS and thinking about where we're going, you know, the old telephones, it, you actually had to dial it and wait for it to go all the way back. Um, we got one of these phones about four years ago because it plugged into our, um, uh, our modem or, or router or whatever it's called. And um, we thought, well, we'll teach the boys how to use this. And Tide was worried, so we let him go first. And we said, OK, um, we'll let it ring and it ring. And he picked it up and uh, he said, hello? Hello? Because he'd never seen a phone before or anyone use a phone before. What, I wonder what would happen if I had to give my boys one of these. <laughs> I'm sure Tide would be worried that there's so many red lines in it. <laughs> what do I do with this? I don't know where I'm going. How do I get there? I remember, I remember taking down directions for how to get to places on a little piece of paper. All right, hold on. Let me put the phone on my ear, grab the pen out the paper and box out the little telephone because there was always a desk where the telephone stand was. And at the telephone stand, there was normally a map and normally a dial where you'd find the people's numbers and there was a piece of paper and a pen because you had to take notes when people phoned you. And so how do I get there? Well, you drive down to the first set of lights and you'll see a shopping center on your left. Yes, shopping center on my left. And you go straight through to the next set of lights and you go through them as well. You get to the traffic circle, but you go straight through the first traffic circle. On the second traffic circle that you get to, you take the first exit. You stay on Harmon until you get to, again, the very first traffic circle you get to. You turn, you take the first exit, and you'll see the sports club parking on your right. That's where you're going. And a lot of the younger ones are looking at me thinking, what? That's how you got places? That's how many instructions you had to follow just to get two kilometers up the road to a sports club? So much easier. Hey, Google, navigate me to Kingsway Sports Club. No problem, I'll take you there. What a wonderful day to play playing sport. Oh, thank you. And when we see this word, I wonder what's maybe the first thing that comes to our mind. Maybe it's, well, I need a job. 
but maybe more appropriately in the current setting that I suppose we're in as we consider the context and our reading this morning, we recognize that that's really talking about Job. And I was a little bit nervous when KJ presented his lesson uh, for two reasons. The reason number one is I thought, oh, I don't have to present a lesson anymore. <laughs> KJ's done my lesson. Uh, but I thought, well, I should still come up here. Yeah, it'd be bad form if I just said, well, you heard it all earlier. And, and some of you weren't, yeah, so here I am. Um, and the other reason why I got really nervous is I thought, I wonder if God's trying to tell me something. Two seriously, lesson, two seriously heavy lessons on suffering. And, and while mine's not entirely on, on suffering, to clarify that, but really it has, it has a lot to do, obviously, with Job. I mean, hence the reading and hence the slide. And where we're going, hopefully, through the course of this lesson. But certainly Job and Horatio as KJ mentioned in this morning's lesson about the song or the hymn that we sing, uh, It Is Well With My Soul, men who experienced tremendous tribulation, tremendous suffering, but yet they knew where they were going, and that's how they got through that suffering. Now, when we're using navigation, right, when we, when we ask Google to take us somewhere, what do we focus on? Generally, we focus on that arrow. Now, before Tide was born and we didn't have a warrior in the vehicle, you know, Shan and I did our own warring. And um, so we were running a little bit late for an, an after work function. And um, these were still new. Like, we were still getting used to navigation systems as opposed to, you know, all the thousands of pieces of paper. And so I said, navigate me to this place. Shan, you take this and just tell me where I need to go. So we're driving along this road. And I said, we're going the right way. Like, I'm, I'm starting to get a little bit worried. Like I said, Todd wasn't in, wasn't in the picture yet. Um, are you sure we're on the... Yes, the blue line. We're, we're on the blue line. Okay, that's all right. Okay, well, if we go, we're going. And I'm thinking, I sort of know where this place is. Are you sure we're right? Yes, I can still see the blue line. What had happened was... Shan had bumped the screen. Now, you know when you bump the screen on these things, it stops following that little arrow. And so all that was left was the blue line. And she's like, yes, I can see the blue line. You're going fine. And the screen's not moving. I can see the blue line. There's no arrow. There's no car. And I was just a little upset. <laughs> like, I've gotten over it. Like, you can hear that, right? I've, I've gotten over it. But, but when we're navigating... We're focusing on that little arrow. Well, most of us are focusing on that little arrow, making sure that that arrow stays on the blue line. But what does that not necessarily uh, reflect? It doesn't necessarily reflect traffic. All right? And what does this context add to the situation? That you're going to be late? Well, well maybe, but... No, not that you, well, okay, maybe, right? I mean, that, if, you, if you're hitting that and that little arrow is there, you're probably not going to meet the time, although Google's getting a lot smarter and starting to understand this, and so maybe some of you are sitting there, well, my Google is so smart that it knows that this is going on. But when Shan was following the blue line and not the arrow, we didn't have that, and so rush hour traffic, it was, we were going to be late. But no, hopefully that's not the context that what I'm, or not, that's not the context I'm wanting you to get from that image. What I'm wanting you to get from that image is that we are not the center of the universe. How many souls are interacting here, do you think, when you look at that? Plenty, right? I mean, that picture stretches all the way down the freeway. How many lives are being affected by this traffic jam? Thousands. Thousands of lives are being affected. And you know what? Each one of them is the center of their own universe. Each one of them. Every person in that long line of cars is sitting there thinking something. I'm going to be late. I'm going to be late for something. Or I don't mind this because I've got all day to get to my holiday destination. Each person is at the center. And as we zoom in maybe into the life of each person. Some will make for better TV 
if you will, than others. There will be a lot more gripping story stories than others. But there must be one story, and amongst all of that, that surely would grip us the most. There just, there just has to be. It wouldn't, wouldn't be the same one for each of us. And this is kind of how I see Job when we read the story of Job. His suffering is so intense. It's, it's so complete. It's so intentional. Focused. It's so gripping that I often find when I read the book of Job, I forget that the world hasn't stopped spinning. Because you're so focused on this man who has lost so much and is being so broken by God. And when KJ uh, presented this morning's lesson about Horatio and how much that man had lost, six children. They say the hardest thing for a parent is to lose a child, and I hope and pray that I never have to empathize with that. But imagine losing six children. Job lost everything. And his pain and his suffering and his life was so intentionally broken that we sometimes forget that the world was ca actually carrying on around him. And I don't know if that makes it better or worse, although I feel personally, uh, I feel quite strongly about it, but it's, it's, I do recognize it's only my opinion. I think that makes it worse. When you're sitting there in the middle of that traffic jam, and you're in the center of your universe, and you really need to be somewhere, everything else falls away around you, and you forget that maybe someone next to you is in just as bad a predicament. Because all you can see is yourself. But when you look around you, you don't see that. You see a whole bunch of other people that are just going about their lives, and they're all definitely not as worse off as you. At least that's how you feel. It is normally not true, but that's how you feel. And that's why I feel that for Job, when you read the book of Job, you get so drawn in that you forget there's actually still a whole world functioning and carrying on, people getting married, people rejoicing, people celebrating, some people going to funerals. And Job wishes for any of that upon himself. And even to the point that he's wishing he could be the person in the casket because his life is so bad. In Job chapter 30 verses 1 through 15, but, they, but now they mock at me, younger men than I, whose fathers I disdain to put out with the dogs of my flock. Indeed, what profit is the strength of their hands to me? Their vigor is perished. They are gaunt from want and famine, fleeing late to the wilderness, desolate and waste, who pluck marrow by the bushes and broom tree roots for their food. They were driven out from among men. They shouted at them as at a thief. They had to live in the, to live in the clefts of the valleys, in the caves of the earth and the rocks. Among the bushes they brayed, under the nettles they nestled, they were sons of fools, yes, sons of vile men. They were scourged from the land, and now I am their taunting song. Yes, I am their byword. They abhor me. They keep far from me. They do not hesitate to spit in my face, because he has loosed my bowstring and afflicted me. They have cast off restraint before me. At my right hand the rabble arises. They push away my feet. They raise against me their ways of destruction. They break up my path. They promote my calamity. They have no helper. And they come as broad breakers. Under the ruinous storm they roll along. Terrors are turned upon me. They pursue my honor as the wind. And my prosperity has passed like a cloud. In the previous chapter, in Job chapter 29, verse 1 through to about 8 or 9, Job is talking about how when he spoke, princes stopped talking. How when he presented an argument, that was the end of the matter. How when people looked for advice, they came to him. How when there's a difficult problem to be solved, they came to him. His words and his wisdom was the beginning and the end. And now, these people that have nothing through their foolishness, through their bad decisions, through their wicked ways, they are now the ones taunting him. Job, 
even though sometimes, me personally, then let me just keep it on myself, even though sometimes when I read this, it's like the whole world disappears when I see this man's incredible pain and suffering and brokenness. But Job was just one man, not in the center of the universe. However, his suffering and his, um, uh, his, his fall was so utterly complete that it cannot help but draw you right in to feel how uh, the brokenness of this man. Something else that I considered when reading this passage and then when looking at the previous chapter is that if you consider that Job possibly had not lost his wisdom, nowhere does it tell us that, you know, when we consider that Job was a counselor to kings, to princes, that he was a problem solver in the courts and the gates of the land. And yet, nowhere does it say that his, his wisdom or his common sense or his understanding was removed from him. We know that all these possessions, we know that his, um, all his family, and we know that his health was stripped from him. But nowhere does it say that his common sense or his wisdom was taken from him. And how hard it is for us when we know the right way, when we know the decision should be, people should be taking, and yet... After they've asked for our advice and after we've shown them and presented a sound logical argument as to why this is the right way, then we go and see them make poor and bad decisions to, the, to their own destruction or maybe even to the destruction of others. How much worse for Job, how much more humiliating, him lying in dust and ashes, having lost everything, including the trust and the faith and the confidence of his friends. And still being endowed with this wisdom, still knowing what is right, still knowing how things should be working. And yet he is there with the foolish and the wicked and the rabble of the land, whom he doesn't even consider worthy to be sleeping with his dogs, mocking him and mocking his words. Job's integrity and person is truly an incomprehensible example for us. When we consider all of this pain and this suffering, we see Job's self-control. I'm not going to read the whole chapter of Job chapter 31. But for me, when I read and went through this chapter in my own studies and in preparing this lesson again, it's just mind-blowing how Job, in the midst of all of this, showing where he came from in chapter 29 to where he was now in chapter 30, and then talking about himself to God, and the reason why I say to God is because it adds the context to, the, to this where I don't think Job was making this up. This was a man that God bragged about to his angels in righteousness. And this was a man that God never asked, why did you lie or why did you sin in your trials? And so I don't believe chapter 31 is Job boasting or inflating his self-righteousness. And so in considering that, this is a man who had incredible self-control as we see in the first four verses of that chapter this is a man whose ethical standards were at the utmost highest of what a man could want or 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 what god wants from a man i believe in verses five through eight his moral standards in verses nine through twelve his respect for all people irrespective for their job irrespective for their station in life irrespective of their wealth or poverty In verses 13 through 15, he treats each man equally. And in verse 30, really, that's just what he's calling for, for asking for of himself, isn't it? Just just treat me as a man. His community service in verse 16 through 23, and that was actually something that really struck me about KJ's lesson as well, how Horatio and his family, after all the tragedy that had befallen them, said, you know what, we're going to go to Jerusalem and just help anyone that we can help. So Job's community service, his reverence toward God, his recognition of God as his provider, and his worship of God as his creator, in verses 24 through 28. His love for his neighbor, and that includes his enemies, when we read verses 29 through 32. And he did not hide the sin in his own life. He says in verse 33 and 34 of chapter 31, If, men, if the men of my tent have not said, 
Have I got the right chapter here? Oh, yeah. Oh, the wrong verse, sorry. If I have covered my transgressions as Adam by hiding my iniquity in my bosom, because I feared the great multitude so that I kept silence and did not go out the door. Job did not hide any of his iniquity from anyone. He confessed his sins when he had done what was wrong. This was a man who truly understood the heart of the law long before Christ walked on this earth to explain it to us. And not only did he understand it truly, but he obeyed it and gave himself fully to the law and the proper understanding of that law. It was Job's understanding of the law and his wisdom and the wisdom of the time that really kept him from from understanding, I should rather say, why this was happening to him. Again, that reference was made by KJ this morning. Job could... He just couldn't put it together. He knew what the law said. And we can see his understanding of it in his correct application of it at every step of the way. Helping the enemies, helping his neighbors, being there for the people, counseling and giving himself to God, confessing his own transgressions and living a life that was completely above reproach to the fact that God bragged about him in the heavenly places. But the one thing that Job did not understand or did not comprehend because of the wisdom and the teaching of the time was that, well, then why is this happening to me? Why not just kill me and take me? And we have touched on Job's faith, but to further consider it again is that despite all of this, even when he couldn't understand something, because he had tremendous wisdom, like I said, in my opinion, I don't think his wisdom was taken from him. And he had an incredible wisdom and an understanding of the law and an understanding of what pleased God. But there was something he didn't understand, and that was why all of this was happening to him. But even in that, despite all of that, his faith and his trust in God never wavered, because Job still always held on to the fact that he knew where he was going. Because he knew the law, and he knew that God was faithful, and he knew that if he just stuck to that, he would be going to be with his Creator one day. Job might, have fully, might not have fully understood why he was suffering, but he trusted God enough to know that if he could just die, if God would just let him die, he would again be at peace. But until he died... He recognized it was not his place to take his own life. And he recognized it was his place to keep holding on to his integrity and his faith. Okay, Google, navigate me to God. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to give this a bash. I'm just going to see what happens. I'm sorry, I don't understand. Do you know where you're going? We don't need Google and we don't need the internet. And in fact, I very highly recommend you stay away from it if you want to know how to get to God. Because this is our instruction. You see, this has never changed. That set of instructions that we used to write down when friends would phone and tell us how to get to their place... Hi, David. I'm coming to your party tomorrow afternoon. My parents want to know how to get there. All right. Do you know how to get to such and such a landmark? Yep. Okay. From there, you're coming from, you're coming from the other shopping center. Go down. That's what God did for us. He wrote us a step-by-step instruction to navigate us that we may have our personal relationship with him. And those instructions never change. They never change. We don't need to go to the internet We don't need to Google it. Hey, Google, what must I do to be saved? Well, it depends. Are you suffering COVID? Wear a mask. Oh, please, no. I'd rather just stay at home. But why are we here? We are here because we know that in our hearts, God is our home. We want to go and be with God. We want to go to heaven. Our Father and our Creator, navigate me to your presence. And so we have the Bible. And in the Bible, we are told to test ourselves in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. We are told to examine ourselves, test yourselves. 
to ensure that you are on the right track. This is the test. These are the instructions that we need to be following. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 17 through 18, we are again told to test ourselves, to examine our faith, and to walk in the light. Because you see, in John chapter 5 and verse 13, a wonderful promise is made. First John chapter 5 and verse 13, we see the promise that these things have been written to you that you may believe in the name of the Son of God and that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Because these instructions are written that we can test ourselves and if we be found faithful after examining ourselves against these instructions, then we can know where we're going. The verse prior to that states, He who has the Son has life. That's what was written, that we can know where we're going, that we can know that we have salvation. If we have the Son, then we have life. And he who does not have the Son does not have life. And to jump back then to John's first letter in the Bible, is John chapter 3 and verse 15, that whoever believes in him that is the Son, should not perish, but have eternal life. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3. All these blessings are in Him, that is Christ, that those who believe in Him have every spiritual richness and blessing that we may be with God one day, that we can know where we're going. In Galatians chapter 3, verse we are instructed how to get in to Christ. The directions say, turn left, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many, as, uh, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 8 and 9. We can know where we're going. And we need to know where we're going. Because it's based on that knowledge that we will make the right decision in our lives. Because if we are not going to be with our Father for all eternity, following these instructions, unfortunately the place that we're going is not going to be such a good place to be. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 4 through 5, the, the church at Ephesus is instructed to remember their first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen and repent and do the first works or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Verse 7, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. We are to remain faithful. We are to remain on the right track. You see, even if you're on the right road, if you're just standing still, you're going to get run over. We've got to be on that road and we've got to keep pushing on. We've got to keep walking the walk and fighting the fight. We've got to keep remembering our first love. Being saved, getting into Jesus Christ is just the first step on that wonderful road that leads us to our eternal home, our eternal truth, and our eternal life. In Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21, we read, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father. We need to be doing the will of God. We need to be following his instruction in the paths of life. In 2 John verse 9 through 10, Oh, sorry. In yeah, Second John verse nine through ten. That is correct. 
uh, we have the following written for us. Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. You see how important it is to follow the descriptions, follow the directions, the instructions of God. If God says turn left at the second traffic circle, don't turn right. That's where you turn left. Whoever transgress, sorry, whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ, praise God, has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house, nor greet him. Do not let anyone distract you from the path you are to take. Don't let anyone touch your screen. You focus on that arrow and you keep going where God guards you through his word. In Proverbs chapter 19 and verse 16, we read, He who keeps the commandment keeps his soul. He who keeps his commandment keeps his soul. But he who is careless of his ways will die. Matthew chapter 22, verse 36 through 39. I'm sure some of you may know this as a memory verse. Job certainly did. Job held on to this. And that's how Job knew where he was going. Always, throughout his life, despite his trials and tribulation. In verse 26, sorry, verse 36, Jesus is asked, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commands hang all the laws and all the prophets, even today. For those who have not yet accepted this truth, there's an opportunity for you to come forward. For those who want to know more about this truth, please ask anyone you feel comfortable talking to, come forward, put your name down to have a study or to talk more. And for those who maybe just want the prayers to reinvigor or re-encourage or reignite the first love, this is also that opportunity for you. Or maybe you just want to use this time through this, this hymn to reflect and to maybe adjust your course. Or maybe this is just a time for us to be encouraged together as a family of God on our road together as we look forward to that great day when we will be with our Creator, with our Lord and with our God in heaven thanks to the love of His Son and thanks to His perfect set of instructions. Please stand as we sing our closing hymn. Thank you. Let us stand. I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's thin light. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, these have on my side. I will hasten to Him, hasten so glad and free. highest, I will come to thee. I am resolved to enter the kingdom, leaving the heart of sin. Friends may oppose me, fools may beset me, still will I enter in. I will hasten to him, Hasten so glad and free, Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to Thee. Thank you. Please be seated. Let us go to our Father in prayer. Dear Lord, our Father in heaven, we are so thankful that we can be gathered here um, on this Sunday morning to um, sing praises to you, 
to honour you and to worship you with this time, dear Lord. And we thank you for allowing us the freedoms that we can have to be gathered here um, as, we know, as we know that there are still many parts of the world um, that are unable to do this. And we thank you for your continued hand of guidance and blessing upon each and every one of us, dear Lord. And we would like to thank you at this time for um, the visitors in our midst. And we would like to especially pray for um, Sandra and Bob, um, our visitors here, and we pray for their health, but also we pray that they may return um, and visit us once again to continue to learn more about your word, dear Lord. And we um, thank you for um, this, um, this day that you've given to us and for the week ahead that we pray that you continue to watch over us and guide us and to keep us safe. And, you can help, and we pray that you help us to um, continue to be a light in this world for you and to continue to um, remain faithful um, and true in your word, dear Lord. We thank you once again for all the things you've given unto us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, a warm welcome to um, everyone here, especially our visitors. We have um, um, Adele um, and Jeremy, who were here a bit earlier, as well as Sandra and Bob. We'd like to welcome um, all of you here this morning. Um, and just a few announcements as per usual. We have our regular uh, midweek Bible class um, continuing on from the book of Matthew, so please join us here at the building. Um, and we have our monthly praise and prayer this Saturday at Auntie Janet's house um, at 7.30. And um, I think that's all the announcements, yep. Um, and just a quick thank you on behalf of um, my new wife and I, I guess that's a bit weird to say, but um, thank you each and every one of um, you for either you know, your warm wishes, your gifts, um, and your attendance at our wedding. It was very much appreciated, and we thank you um, that we could celebrate um, this day with all of you. And um, please stay back and eat, eat some cake. There's um, a lot of it, as, as in the whole wedding cake is still there. So please um, stay back and eat some cake as well. Thank you, everyone.